Hi everyone, welcome back. So today, if you can't tell from the sign next to me, we are talking about dialogue. We're going to start off with a discussion of basic speech tags, and we'll move into uh, talking about said versus some of those other verbs. We're gonna look at some adjectives. We're going to talk about how to add action to your dialogue. And then we'll look at dialogue with purpose and when you need to maybe revise your dialogue so that it helps to do things like add more depth to your character, move the story along, that kind of thing. So let's get started. Um, essentially, to give you a little definition before we dive in, dialogue is when you have talking, <laughs> typically between two or more characters. Now, if you have, let me move that over a tad bit. There we go. If you have one character talking to themselves, that is what we call a monologue. So one character talking. Um, sometimes internal dialogue is, is done as a monologue. Sometimes it's done um, as a point of view, depending if you have a first person point of view and whether or not your character is talking out loud. So mono means one, di means two, and log means talk. That's where we get those words from, just in case you were kind of wondering. So we're going to focus on um, first some basic speech tags. And I'm gonna have what's probably gonna be the most boring dialogue in the world. So, if I can capitalize it correctly. Hello, said Mark. Mary responded. Hello, Mark. Nice to see you. Um, so we can have I'm gonna change this just for, for our purposes right now. You can have your speech tag after the dialogue, you can have it before the dialogue, or you can have it in the middle. So you could have something like, um, I am hungry, said Mark. Let's go get something to eat. Now, there's a lot of different rules to punctuation. I'm not going to go into those. Uh, you have a document, if you're in my class, about how to punctuate dialogue. If you're not in my class, you can Google that, um, where to put the commas, the periods, the exclamation points, that kind of thing. But I just want to show you, um, essentially, I have a lot of times newer authors ask me, should I put my dialogue tags at the beginning? Should I put them at the end? Should I be consistent? Um, some people like to put them at the end all the time. Some people like to put them at the beginning all the time. Um, some people like to mix it up. It really kind of is your choice, whatever you, whatever you prefer. Um, so you can do sorry, <laughs> hitting my mic here, very excited about dialogue today, but you can do any one of those three things. You can also have um, a back and forth dialogue without speech tags if you have kind of a good understanding. So now we've set up, it's Mark and Mary. Um, how I have, what about pancakes? Nah, let's get burgers. Sounds good. Okay, so I would assume since we go back and forth that this, I'll put it in yellow for Mary, then this is Mark, and then we have Mary again. I don't necessarily need a speech tag every time. Now, I have also seen people where there are 20 or 30 lines like this and it's very, it becomes very difficult to tell and to keep up with who's saying what, especially if your characters are having an argument or a disagreement or a long discussion. So you might want to like for the next part, um, I might have Mark said, actually just want to go by myself. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Bye then. <laughs> okay. So we, we add this little tag of Mark 
in the middle just to kind of remind the reader who's talking. And then we have Mary again, and then we have Mark. And I know that this is very lame dialogue, but I kind of doing that on purpose. So, um, so that's essentially how those speech tags work. Now you can also, um, well, let's talk about the word said and some, some synonyms for said. So some things, these are other words you could use for said. You can have shouted. There are like 300 of these. I'm not going to list them all, but I'll, I'll put just a few here. Shouted, replied, whispered, um, asked, mentioned, hinted, retorted, scream, screamed, commented, um, expressed, pleaded, offered, some opposites there, um, pronounced, <laughs> announced, stated, um, remarked, etc. Okay, so tons of things that you can use. So the, the thing is that there's a couple ways that you want to use these. The first is when you want a character to speak in a certain or particular way. What I mean by that is, um, let's say that your character is in a dangerous situation. And rather than say, I'm gonna put a big no here. Um, what should we do? Um, Hank asked quietly. Um, we don't need this adjective here. Um, so I should, I guess I should add that when you want your character to speak in a particular way, but you don't want an unnecessary adjective. Okay. So does Hank need to ask it quietly? A lot of people think if there's a question mark that he needs to ask it. I feel like the, uh, it's implied that he's asking a question because there's a question mark there. So instead, um, what should we do? Hank whispered. Okay, so now we have that word instead of said, and it's a stronger verb. So sometimes, sometimes a synonym for said can be a stronger word. And this is particularly true. I, I guess I'll, I'll put this as a number two. Sometimes a cinnamon for set, a, syn, a synonym um, for said, for the word said, can be a stronger word that conveys more meaning because the word said very often fades into the background, meaning that your readers won't notice if you're using the word said, they'll focus on the words in the dialogue. So if you want the character to speak in a particular way, if you want something that conveys more meaning, this is when you should use those synonyms. So I will have, um, Jose pleaded, please let me out of here. And then I could have, let's say he's in a jail and the jailer responds, um, no, the jailer said, okay. Um, we don't necessarily need another strong verb there. Said might be okay. Now you could have responded or you could have replied. That's not the worst thing in the world. What you don't want to do, so this is kind of my, my rule three, you don't want too many of these synonyms 
if I could type correctly today, that would be helpful. So what I mean by that is, let's take this dialogue from Jose um, and the jailer. They're going back and forth. Ho Jose pleaded, please let me out of here. No, the jailer replied. Jose whispered, I just want to go home. Um, why? The jailer inquired. It's not like you have a home to go back to. I don't know what's going on with Jose, but apparently he doesn't have a home to go back to. Um, then we might have Jose re responding. Let me use a, a, a little bit of a different... What? Jose screamed. The jailer laughed. We burned it. Okay. So here's here's what ends up happening. Um, it, it's not. It seems maybe not quite so bad. Um, just in these one, two, three, four, five, six or seven lines here. Um, but if you had this continually through a book, it would kind of be annoying to your reader. Your reader does not need to have pleaded, replied, whispered, inquired, screamed, laughed. They don't really need that. And if you're using them, if you're overusing them, then they lose their meaning. So overuse leads to a diminishment of meaning. What, I'm, what I mean by that is that, um, you know, if you have a character whispering everything, <laughs> it's going to become really annoying. And then when they're ask, actually whispering or when you really want them to scream or shout or, or laugh, um, then we've already seen those words. So the emotion doesn't quite hit as well um, when you finally really need that, um, that intonation to be there in the way that people are talking. Um, so I'd like you to kind of think about that. When can I use these synonyms and when can I lose them? <laughs> when can I get rid of them? Um, you really want the, the speech tag sometimes to kind of fade into the background so that your, your reader can focus on what your characters are saying. So the other um, thing here is that you can add some action instead. So I'm just going to, for the sake of not typing this over and over, um, let's take this little dialogue between the, um, and I'll put a heading, adding action instead of speech tags. I'm going to put this in here. We'll switch some stuff up. Um, I want him, let's keep the pleaded and the replied. Um, Jose paced around his small cell, period. Now, there's no comma here. I'm going to highlight this in, let's do yellow. Okay. Why? It's not like you have a home to go back to. Let's, we don't really need a speech tag there. What? And then let's have Jose um, sank onto the small stained mattress in the corner. Um, let's have it be his small stained mattress. I feel like that gives a little bit more emotion. Um, and I'll keep laughed. So um, now what happens when we add this action? Well, first of all, if this was a longer scene of dialogue where these two characters are going back and forth, back and forth, it can become a bit boring for your reader. The other thing is that realistically, we're going to, you know, your dialogue should be authentic and realistic. And realistically, do we have a conversation um, where we're just standing there talking like this, especially an emotionally charged conversation? Typically not. If you add a little bit of action in with your dialogue, 
it gives your reader something to picture. It doesn't seem as static. So the characters aren't just standing there. Um, please let me out of here. No, I just want to go home. Why? It's not like you have a home to go back to. They're not just standing face to face. Um, if you think about it like um, a movie or a real scene, you would have um, you know, in a movie, you would have the actor doing something. It's called blocking. So while they're saying their lines, they're moving around, they're, they're pacing, they're, they're running their hands through their hair. Um, and here, pacing around his small cell shows that he wants to get out, right? So that action adds meaning to the dialogue. He feels like he's trapped in this cage. I just want to go home. Why? It's not like you have a home to go back to what and then all of a sudden he collapses in he sinks onto this small stained mattress and the jailer laughs at him while he's having a breakdown the action really adds emotion to the scene you can also have a more mundane conversation where um you know someone is goes to maybe there's there's two people talking one really doesn't want to be in the conversation and they walk out of the room to go and make themselves a sandwich and the other person continues to talk you could have that kind of thing too but um for interest of the reader for for adding that emotion for keeping your um your reader on track and for adding a little bit to have them picture the scene um having that action there can really help you don't have to have it every time you notice i kind of mixed it up right dialogue tag dialogue tag uh, action, no tag, action, and then another dialogue tag. So it's not just action, 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 action every time. Um, again, having a little bit of that balance. So let's do one more example. We'll say that we have um, Nick and Lori, and they are in a relationship, and they are having an argument. So um, let's start that off. I'll do the dishes when I do the dishes, Nick said. So basically, you'll never do the dishes, and I'll end up doing them. Emily mumbled. Nick stood up and slammed his hands on the table. You're such a nag. You're just like your mother. I should have listened to your dad day of our wedding that escalated quickly <laughs> i should too if i'm gonna do this you know you need to tab that in but it's hard with the bigger font you can't really see it that well um emily began to tear up i was gonna call her Lori. that's fine emily it is emily began to tear up what did my dad say to you Nick rolled his eyes. Nothing. It doesn't matter. I shouldn't have mentioned it. But you did mention it. She said. And now it's all I'll think about. Now, um, a couple things here. Uh, Sorry for the very long bit of typing. So we have the speech tag at the end here, and we have said. Then we switch it up a little bit. We want her to, you know, mumbling kind of shows that maybe they have a little bit of an unequal power relationship here. Maybe she doesn't want to confront him directly. Um, maybe she doesn't um, feel like she can say things out loud that she's feeling. So I think the the word mumbled might might give you a little bit of characterization um, 
than you might have if, if you just said said or um, it's certainly different than her shouting at him, right? So she mumbles a comment, possibly under her breath, and then how does he react? So I put this in pink. Um, no, I don't like that. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Um, she mumbles something, and he stands up and slams his hands on the table. And then presumably with the exclamation point is shouting at her, right? Then she starts to tear up, so we have more action there. And in response, he rolls his eyes, and then we have again, um, back to the yellow, she said. And if you notice the pattern here, um, this, this, you know, we're going to talk about style later on. This just happens to be my style. I like to mix it up a little bit. If you have it always at the end, if you have it always at the beginning, if you always put it in the middle, it's not going to be the worst thing in the world. It, it's sort of dependent on your style. But, um, yeah, so end, end, beginning, 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 and then a middle. So even in this short little bit, um, this short excerpt, as it were, there we go. Um, we have a little bit of mixing up and we have a couple sets. We have one synonym in there to, to give a little bit of character development. And then we have some actions so that you can picture how this argument is going to be escalating. She's saying, you mentioned it and now it's all I can think about. Maybe he starts yelling. Maybe he walks out. We don't know what's going to happen next because I'm coming up with this as I'm talking. But um, the essential thing is here, I hope that you can see how those speech tags work. So my other rules for dialogue. Um, I have two and then kind of a third one that goes with the second. Okay, so the first one is that your dialogue has to have purpose. I don't like has and have, so I will say your dialogue must have purpose. It must. Um, so what are the purposes for dialogue? Um, you can, as we just saw uh, a moment ago, increase or decrease conflict. So um, build that tension that we talked about before or release the tension. We talked about with plot, we're gonna talk about more with conflict. Um, the other thing is to drive forward the plot. Um, so having something that's going to occur, the characters are talking about it, they're talking about a situation that happened or that it's going to happen, or they're um, in the midst of that situation trying to deal with it, right? Uh, driving forward the plot in some way. Maybe we find out new information about someone or something and that drives forward the plot. Um, adding depth to the characters. We talked a lot about that when we looked at characterization, what they say, what they do, what people say about them. So how are the characters talking? You know, we just looked at Emily mumbling. Her husband is shouting at her. That, that shows, at least in that scene, a little bit of a difference between their characters. Now, maybe we found out later that Emily mumbles everything and she's quite passive aggressive and that Nick's kind of done with it. And maybe we have more sympathy for him. But at least in that scene, I think we have more sympathy for her and we're adding a little bit of depth of characterization. He's bringing up something that happened at their wedding that has to do with their dad. He's comparing her to their, her mother. Um, those are the, the arrows that kind of hurt people, right? So increase the conflict drive forward the plot you could also have um a little bit of setting so it adds adding to just have the same kind of verbs here every time add detail to the setting so maybe we have a period piece where people are speaking in a certain way because that's the 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 words that they would have used so let's say it takes place in 1920s having a a, a young teenage character say 23 skidoo i still don't know what that means but it's kind of like um how we would say cool let's let's go let's do it um 
23 skidoo um, shows a little bit of detail to that setting. Sometimes it could be the characters describing um, what they're seeing or what they're encountering, and that way we get setting details as well, as long as you don't info dump and put like, we're, we're next we're gonna come up on uh, Canal Street and we're gonna make a left. You don't need that kind of thing to add your details to setting, but um, you can have a, a character talking in a way that shows the, the time period they're in, or um, maybe you have a fantasy novel where they are um, using words that you've kind of made up, or um, that kind of thing, or they're describing a, um, a, a ritual, a ceremony, a type of building that might be unique to that world, a type of animal, those kind of things. But you have to do something um, one of those one of those things that I've just mentioned. So the reason that I mentioned this is again, I find that we talked about this, I think with plot that you don't need to have every single step of your journey. Um, you don't need to have people um, moving from the front door down their front steps across the street over to the house next door and then knocking on the door you can cut from them wanting to talk to the person across the street to them talking to the person across the street and the kind of the same thing happens with dialogue sometimes i think that um the, my my next real ha rule has to do with authenticity and i think that people think that they should um be authentic in their dialogue and so here's here's an example here's what they'll have let's say there's a phone conversation um, between two people so Michael picked up the phone hello hello Michael the voice on the other and said, um, we get, there we go. Our taps came, there we go. Okay. Um, who is this? Michael asked. It's your Aunt Donna. Oh. <laughs> Hello, Aunt Donna. How are you today? I am fine. <laughs> I am going to Florida soon. The weather is too cold up here. Okay, so um, other than D Aunt Donna going to Florida, which might be a plot point. Um, we don't need, we don't need all of this. We don't need the weird um, pleasantries. Yes, it is quite cold. Michael agreed. <laughs> Too cold for my blood. I've edited things that, that sound a lot like this. Um, can we have a more interesting conversation? Um, I find that certain genres lend themselves to this type of dialogue more than others. So if you are hoping to write romance, for example, and you have a character asking another character out, um, you don't need to have them call and say, hello, how are you doing today? I am uh, fine. I am having a good day. I planted flowers this morning. Oh, that sounds nice. That sounds like a lot of fun. Anyway, I was wondering, just get to the asking out or add some details of like the person's hands are sweaty. They're shaking. They're wondering whether she's going to say yes. We get a little bit of inner dialogue before we have the question. They stumble over their words, right? Um, those kind of things. These general kind of pleasantries, um, uh, you could you could cut a lot of this and have you could cut at least these two lines 
at least those two lines. And if you have some dialogue like this and you're writing a, a short story where every word counts, two lines is a good cut to make. If you have a book, those two lines are going to be two lines more probably in the next scene. Um, and you probably could cut this too. So let's say it's your Aunt Donna. I'm going to Florida soon. The weather is too cold here. And then um, I would actually do that. There we go. That's the interesting part of the conversation. We went from like eight lines to three. Um, and then we could have Michael laughed. Um, living in, let's say, South Carolina. Never really got that cold. But his aunt always did love the heat and unlike most 80 year olds he knew she'd be doing more than sitting in Miami and then we could have him say something like um, yeah, fix that hyphenate it properly and then we could have him say something like um got any hot dates lined up in miami <laughs> okay so what we've got instead um we don't need to say aunt donna said right so we can leave that speech tag out we have action here of him picking up the phone and then we have some action and inner thoughts here and then we have more dialogue but it's a lot more interesting than the first version and even if this was the plot point um having it's your aunt donna i'm going to florida soon oh yeah it's getting cold up here yep too cold for my blood anyway i know you're going to miami what you got planned like get to it <laughs> get to the point get to the point um have that you know this is his kooky aunt and we have uh the details here to show that she's kind of kooky and maybe she says uh you know maybe she wants him to whatever house sit or come down with her and and check out these men and see which one is best for her and make sure she doesn't get a gold digger maybe that's our inciting incident i don't know but um there is a little bit of characterization here we have maybe the setup for a plot point and now we have some purpose to that dialogue and we've got about the same amount of lines we had before but more going on and and most importantly your reader isn't going to be bored so the second rule is authenticity um the problem here is that so what i mean by this is that your dialogue should sound realistic we're going to talk about that with um setting as well we're going to use the word verisimilitude i can spell it right there we go um verisimilitude essentially means the appearance of being real or true and that is what should be happening with your dialogue Part of that is is that um, part of the problem with that is that we do that awkward chit chat that I was just showing you, and it is very realistic, but it doesn't work for a book um, or a story. But what you um, want to do is have um, words, phrases um, first that sound the way that people talk. In real life you should also as part of that have um, dialogue that sounds like your characters we're going to talk a lot about this in the um, readings for this week when I go over that all the characters and uh, this particular reading sound the same and so the author had to do a lot of work to make the characters sound different but it should sound like your character so what I mean by that is um, if your character is meek and mild 
like em <laughs> milk, meek and mild, like Emily we just saw, then they are not going to shout. They're not going to probably be very blunt in the way that they talk, right? Um, alternatively, if you, you know, you have a teenager, unless they're very different and you're trying to show that difference, they're not going to be very stilted. If you have, um, someone who is quite uptight and formal. Um, if you uh, read this for this week, The Learning in Hydra, we have uh, Hercule Poirot's valet, who's very formal all the time, and his his dialogue sounds that way. So um, yeah, they should sound sound the way people talk in real life, sound like your characters, and, and essentially they should in that way um, fit the characterization that you've developed. They should be consistent. That's essentially what I'm trying to say. Now, a few things that you want to watch out for. Um, be careful about using slang. The reason is I used before 23 skidoo. That is not a term that we use anymore. And if you read, I think for this week, one of the other options is the Big Blonde. Um, that is a story written in the 1920s or 30s, and it sounds like it because they're using this slang that we don't use today. So they say, oh, my eye it was. You're giving me the runaround. There are other things like that in there that, that don't, um, it's dated. It's dated. So be careful about slang because it can date your work. Now, if you want your work to be dated, maybe you're writing something that's set in the 1980s, you want it to sound like the 1980s, then yes, use some of that slang. Don't overuse it because it'll be annoying um, and it won't be authentic, but use some of that slang here and there to kind of punctuate and show your time period, right? Um, another thing that I would like you to be careful about are, um, be careful about using dialect. Now, dialect is language that's particular to a region and or group of people. So here's here's a good example of dialect. Um, if you live in New York and New Jersey, you might say, hey, you guys. Um, that is a common phrase around here, around these parts. Um, if you live in certain places in the South, you might have, hi, y'all. Um, if when I when I lived down south and I'd say, um, hey, guys, what were we doing? And, and some of the, the women would be like, I'm, I'm not a guy. Why are you using that phrase? Um, it's just a phrase that, that we use up here to mean, hey, everybody or hey, hey, y'all. Um, you might have instead somebody typing text messages that says, what up? Um, you want to be careful with um, dialect, though. Those are some, some small things that can show the region. Um, but particularly if it comes to looking at um, a, a race that's other than yours, a culture that's other than yours, you really don't want to fall into being stereotypical. And I did have to work at one point with an author on that because they had a book that was set in a particular region where there were different um, people of different races living there. And the people who were white all were not speaking with the dialect and every person of color was speaking with the dialect and it was very stereotypical and very um, offensive. And so if you're using some of those regional phrases, you can, um, if it is part of your culture and you want to show um, what the people around you sound like, um, you can, but otherwise I would um, stay away from it. So the third thing to be careful about, um, be careful when using swear words. <laughs> this is not to say you can't have swear words in your text, but um, I was uh, in a conference one time where people were arguing about 
the the age group that would be reading the book and whether or not they could use swear words in it. And what the one woman said was, well, Megan, you just said that our dialogue needs to be authentic. And this is a book about 11 and 12 year olds. And I hear 11 and 12 year olds. I have grandchildren and I know that they uh, swear and they curse and that kind of thing. And I said, well, here's the thing. They do sometimes, um, but not all of them do. And more importantly, for that age group, they're not the ones buying the books. The parents and teachers and librarians are the ones buying the books. And so for that reason, even though um, a kid saying shit might be realistic and authentic, unless it's a book for adults, um, you really want to avoid that. So be careful when using swear words when writing for children or teens and consider whether another word might suffice. Um, can you can you have something without <laughs> without cursing, particularly um, if you're talking about um, this wasn't like for children, children, it was more like for middle grade. So tweens, but even teens, some people, um, you know, want their books in schools and and you can have heavy subject matter. You can have, um, interestingly enough, you can have things that have to do with violence or trauma or sexuality, but it's the language that sometimes gets a book banned. So um, I'm not saying don't use it if it's for teens. I'm just saying that you need to kind of think about your audience a little bit. So um, those are my tips for dialogue. And I hope that you learned a little bit. And um, make sure to check out the video on the readings for this week because I walk through some of the before and after changes with the um, instructive readings and I talk a lot about um, the authenticity and the characterization and, um, and all of that with the other two readings. So that's it. I can't wait to see the dialogues that you guys write this week. Thanks.